This morning we're going to uh, talking about love versus fear. That's always a good uh, good thing to look at. With the we want to do that, and in order to do that, we need to uh, answer the question: What does perfect love casts out fear? What does that really mean? What is that? How does that defined in our life? What does perfect love cast out fear mean? We hear it used all the time, and and uh, we even have it on our bumper sticker sometimes, our T-shirts, perfect love cast out fear. We hear that. Well, let's begin with 1 John 4, 7, and 8, which our song was even about here today. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God, that's right, and knows God. That's our amen corner right over here today. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And leave that up for a little bit. Uh, what a great passage. A lot revolves around that passage, and you got to read that in context when you get a chance. Read that whole chapter. All these verses are in your bulletin, as they always are. Love is of God, and God is love, and love is a fundamental characteristic of who God is. That's part of his temperament, if you will. If you don't know what temperament is, Google it. That's a part of who he is. Everything God does is compelled and influenced by his love. I know that's hard to imagine when you read uh, uh, the Old Testament, right? But it is. If you'll, if you'll put that all together with the New Testament, you'll see that everything that God does is compelled and influenced by his love. He is the originator of love. And, and it is an enduring attribute of his nature. There is a distinct word then for the type of love, and we know this, we've done a lot of messages on this, but some of you, I can't assume that everybody knows, so I have to, you know, we, we need reminding, but there's a distinct type of love that God is and God displays. In the Greek, the word is agape. We've heard that love. In fact, I think an insurance company has, has stolen that for their commercials now. Have you seen that? What? Do what? You want to just call them up and say, stop that. But anyway, agape. And agape refers to a benevolent and charitable love that seeks the best for the loved one. And the greatest thing about agape, that it is unconcerned with the self, unconcerned with the one giving it. It's concerned with the greatest good of another, which is an amazing thing if you think about all the scriptures that we know, uh, that uh, and you take the context of the entire Bible, that's absolutely true. Agape love. If, if you look how God has treated us, that's absolutely true. Agape isn't born out of emotion. In fact, there's really, it's a decision. There's not, not much emotion involved in it. Agape isn't feelings. It's, it's really not familiarity or attraction. It's, agape is born from the will. It is a choice. God chooses to love us. And man, just try to turn that around. If you were God and looked and look at yourself, would you choose you to love? Probably not. You know, I wouldn't choose me. We've said that a million times, right? But agape is a choice. It, it's God's willing. He chooses to love us. Agape requires faithfulness. It requires commitment. It requires sacrifice without expecting anything in return. Wow. Wow, do we know anything about that? Not much. Our new nature is trying to teach us about that, but our old nature struggles with that, right? Agape is a choice, a deliberate striving for another's highest good, and is demonstrated through action. God set the standard for agape, which is the ultimate standard, in sending his son. That's the standard for agape, sending Jesus to die for us while we were still sinners, while we were still against him while we were rebelling against him, while we were spitting in his face and pulling his beard, while we were the ones driving the nails in his wrist and in his feet, while we were still sinners. That's the standard. Oh, my goodness. That's a pretty high standard. But that's the standard for agape love. So that, that helps us understand what agape love really is. It's not uh, some standard set in a commercial. Okay, that's what agape love is. So in understanding that then, in understanding this love, you can go further. Let's go to John, 1 John 4.18, where, where, we, where we start with answering this question. It's written there, perfect love casts out fear. 
Perfect meaning mature and completed. Well, God is perfect love. God is agape love. We know that he's perfect. So he is the one that casts out fear. God is. He's the one. In love versus fear, God wins because God really is the one who's, who's up against our fear. He's the one that casts out fear, not our love. God is, because God is love. God, so when we say perfect love cast out fear, we can know we are saying that the love of God or God himself, by way of his precious Holy Ghost in us, God himself is the one casting out fear. He's the one driving fear away. It's just so we understand that. Because you can be the most loving person on the planet uh, in enough, or think you're the most loving person on the planet and still be afraid of a whole lot of things. So it's God that's cast, driving around the fear. It's the love of God or God himself because God is love. He's the one that's casting out fear. 1 John 4, 16 through 18. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. And the one who abides in love and abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because as he is so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. There's a whole lot of stuff going on in that verse, a whole lot of shaking going on. The, the fear that perfects, that, that, I'm sorry, the fear that perfect love casts out is the fear of God's judgment. Now, if you take that in context, that's what this, the fear that it's talking about. It's the fear of God's judgment and sentencing, the fear of God's condemnation. We know that judgment day is coming. We all know that. We believe that. We trust that to be absolutely true. But those who are in Christ know the love of God, which drives away the fear of punishment, the fear of condemnation. Because that should be, if it's not, that should be our biggest fear. And intrinsically, it is. We may not know that's our biggest fear, but intrinsically, put inside of us, God has put inside of us that fear. That is our biggest fear, punishment from God. That's our biggest fear. Do not be misled in your thinking. Perfect love casts out the fear of punishment or condemnation or being judged and sentenced by God. That's the fear that's driven out. Here's John, uh, 1 John 4.18 from the Amplified Bible, which expands on the original language. Okay, there is no fear in love. Dread does not exist. But perfect, complete, full-grown love drives out fear because fear involves the expectation of divine punishment so that the one who is afraid of God's judgment is not perfected in love, has not grown into a sufficient understanding of God's love. The dismissal of the fear of judgment is one of the main functions of God's love. Now, so now, now he drives out some other fears too, but if you've got, if this fear of divine punishment, of divine judgment is gone, what else have you got to be afraid of? What Psalms say, what, what can man do to me? Go ahead, stab me, shoot me, beat me, kill me. I win. Really, really, you think about it. What else, what else can man do to me? The dismissal of the fear of judgment is one of the main functions of God's love. The person without Christ is under judgment, is under condemnation, and has plenty to be afraid of. They may, may not know that's why they're afraid, but that's why they're acting the way they're acting is because they're in fear. You know how people act when they're afraid. And they don't know why. Fear of the unknown. There's this intrinsic fear inside of them because they're afraid of divine punishment. That's why they're crazy. That's why they get upset when you say, Jesus. They get all freaked. You can say, God. We talked about this. You can say, God. You can, <laughs> you can say some supernatural being. You can even say, Creator. But you say, Jesus. Ah! They go, they've got this intrinsic fear of punishment from God especially those ones who, who have that seed planted. You see it in their eyes. They say things and do things, and they try to hurt you and hurt other people who are believers. They rebel, and they, they try to, they, well, I, I could go on. That's another message for another day. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. We'll go on. 
But there's a fear there. John 3.18, whoever believes and has decided to trust in him as personal Savior and Lord is not judged for this one. There is no judgment, no rejection, no condemnation. But the one who does not believe and has decided to reject him as personal Savior and Lord is judged already. That one has been convicted and sentenced because he has not believed and trusted in the name and the one and only begotten Son of God, the one who is truly unique, the only one of his kind, the one who alone can save him. There's plenty to be afraid of there. That's mega fear. However, once a person is in Christ, the fear of judgment is gone. Why? Because we're reconciled to God. And there is now nothing to be afraid of in terms of condemnation. We know that from Romans 8, 1, therefore, we know the Scripture, therefore, there is now no condemnation, no guilty verdict, no punishment for those who are in Christ Jesus, who believe in Him as personal Lord and Savior. None. So when you beat yourself up and you condemn yourself, you judge yourself and condemn yourself, you're doing the opposite of what the Holy Spirit wants to do in your life. When you condemn, when you when you mess up, when you when you sin and and you repent and turn from that and turn back to God, but you keep going back to that and saying, I'm I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You're doing the opposite of what the Holy Spirit wants to do in your life. Because once you repent and turn from that, God says he's removed that. It's gone as far as the east is from the west, and you keep bringing it up. God says, stop it because I don't know what you're talking about. You're a crazy person. It's gone. It's been erased. What are you talking about? Let's move on. Part of the understanding of the, uh, uh, the love of God is knowing that God's judgment fell on Jesus at the cross. And that, so that, that spares us from that. But it doesn't spare you from that until you accept it, believe it, turn, which is repenting, turn from your ways and turn to his and, and, and actually accept that he's, he's given his life for you. So it doesn't benefit you until you accept it, believe it, confess it, and turn from the way you're living and turn to his way. So Isaiah 53, 6, all of us, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned, not believed and trusted in the name of the one and only begotten Son of God. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned each one to his own way. But the Lord has caused the wickedness of us all, our sin, our injustice, our wrongdoing, to fall on him, Jesus, to fall on him instead of us. That was four or five hundred years before. Amazing. That was amazing. The sacrifice of Jesus appeased God's justice and won his good favor for us. For us. So we don't have anything to be afraid of. If we accept it, if we live it, if we walk in it, if we, if, well, 1 John 2, 2, and he, that same Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins. And this is what propitiation means, the atoning sacrifice that holds back the wrath of God that would otherwise be directed at us because of our sinful nature, our worldliness, our lifestyle. And not for ours alone, but also for the sins of all believers throughout the whole world. Jesus told us this about himself in John three seventeen. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge and condemn the world, that is, to initiate the final judgment of the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, yeah. That, that's, a, that's a, yeah, that's got bacon on it. Man, crispy bacon. The only person who needs to be afraid is the one who rejects Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That's the only one who needs to be afraid. You do not need to be afraid. That's a big deal because we're afraid of a lot of things. We're afraid of a lot. The Bible clearly communicates in Romans 8, 38 through 39 that nothing can separate the believer from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God's love does not come and go. 
Now, you may have experienced that in your natural upbringing, in your biological environment. You may have experienced what you perceived was the love that came and go based on your behavior. If you're good, you get this. If you're bad, you don't get it. You may have experienced that. God's love, his agape love, does not come and go. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. So stop thinking that way. Perfect love casts fear. That's a fear. Let go of that. God's love does not come and go. It is not an unpredictable or an emotional sensation. He doesn't bring up in an argument what you did in 1962. Well, I remember when. You're going to talk to me like that. I remember when. That's not God. He doesn't do that. It's not an emotional sensation. God's love is why Christ died on the cross. God's love is how he holds us in his hand and promises to never, ever let us go. Never. We do not need to fear. Listen to John 10, 29. My Father who has given it to me is greater and mightier than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Them is you. It's me. No one's able to do that. Now, can you jump? We'll talk about that later. His divine love will take away our fear. Luke 12, 32, do not be afraid and anxious little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Praise his holy name. To give you the kingdom. If as a child of God we still fear God's punishment, it means we have not yet reached the point of maturity in love. 2 Timothy 1.7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Notice how he threw love in there. He had to, because love casts out fear. Perfect love casts out fear. He couldn't just say, but of power and a sound mind, because that'd be incomplete. He has to have love in there, because that's who he is. We can say with the psalmist in Psalm 56.11, in God have I put my trust and confident reliance, I will not be afraid. Now, that's not a a psychological measure where you convince yourself not to be afraid. I'm not going to fall when I step off of here. I'm I'm just going to be solid, and I'm going to walk right over that chair. No. It's not mind over matter. It's not. It's we put our trust in God. How can we do that with such confidence? How is it possible? possible to be that confident, Pastor Jerry? How can I do that? How can we have such a sound mind and walk in such assured security without being afraid? Experience is the key. It is. Action is the key. Faith with works. Why? Because faith without works is dead. Action is the key. Perfected love, mature love, God's love drives out or casts out fear when we don't just talk the talk, but we walk the walk. And I've got the, I don't have, well, I could show it to you, but Dennis got me a, I don't, man, I said your name, I apologize, but a buddy of mine got me a postcard. <laughs> and it's got an old logo on it that we used to use and how T-shirts and posters, it's, it's keep on trucking and this guy's walking. Yeah. Keep on walking. It's the greatest thing, in the, but keep on walking. When you got to walk the walk, perfected love, mature love, it, it happens when you walk the walk. That's when you drive out fear. When you walk, not just talk, but you actually walk. That drives out fear, not because you're purposely thinking, well, I'm driving out fear, yep, yep, yep. I'm driving out fear because I'm walking. No, it just happens. It, I know. That was that guy. That's a cartoon character, I think. Uh, most... <laughs> Yeah, they they stopped medicating me a long time ago. (laughs) Most of us, most of us are great about the action of letting God love us. Most of us are great, not all of us, but most of us are great about that. Yes, God loved me, and we let him do that. And that's the first part of the action needed to begin to cast out fear. That's the first part. But to complete the work of love, we have to act by loving others. That completes the work. That's, that's perfected. That's complete love is when you love others, when you l- let God love others through you. This, Amen, sister. This is how we gain. This is how we gain confidence in the day of judgment. This is how we know that we have confidence in the day of judgment. God loves us, and then we let God love others through us. That's how we gain confidence. That's how we stand before him, knowing, hey, it all worked out. It was completed. This is, how, this is how we know we are not in line for punishment. 
This is how we know, by putting God's love into action for other people. 1 John 3, 18 through 19. Little children, believers, dear ones, let us not love merely in theory. <laughs> theory. Makes me think of evolution. Let us not love merely in theory, with word or with tongue, giving lip service to compassion, but in action and in truth, in practice and in sincerity, because practical acts of love are more than words. By this we will know without any doubt that we are of the truth and will assure our heart and quiet our conscience before him. Why? Because action, faith with works. Or how about 1 John 3, 14? We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers and sisters. He who does not love remains in spiritual death. It all ties together. When you love each other with a love that is more than just talk, with the love of God reaches out practical and, and tangible in your life, uh, you will experience a deep and unshakable confidence before God which will chase fear away, and you won't even know it's gone. You just look back and realize, oh, what I used to be afraid of, I'm not afraid of anymore. Wow. I used to be afraid to get up on stage. I'm not afraid anymore, but I don't turn around. <laughs> but, you know, step at a time. And the reason... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. And the reason there is no fear in love is that there is no threat of punishment for being a loving person, not from God. Think about that now. When you love someone with real practical deeds, you never hear a warning sign from the Holy Spirit that says, you're going to get punished for that. Never, 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 never. He never says that, right? Love is never threatened with punishment from God because God is love. That is why there's no fear in love. Praise his holy name. When you walk the walk, fear has to go. It has to. It has no choice. Perfect love casts out fear. Praise his holy name. Now, I'm hoping that the Lord allows, but next week I hope we talk about what does love look like in action because we've all got our own subjective idea of what that looks like. There's some guidelines in Scripture that will give us some, some objective uh, guidelines, but it also still remains subjective because for each person sometimes it is subjective of what love looks like. Uh, it's easy to say what love does not look like because we're experts at saying that. We're expert, but I want, I want to confront some things because we all hear every day, well, not every day, but some of us may hear it every day, well, you're supposed to be such a good Christian, but you did not do blah, 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 blah. If you were such a good Christian, you would do blah, 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 blah. Well, let's talk about what love looks like. Let's talk, let's, biblically, what does that look like as far as uh, loving one another? We'll talk about that, okay, so that we have at least some clearer guidelines because sometimes... Uh, that four-letter word love is some other four-letter word. And we don't need to be living that. Okay? But we'll talk about that hopefully next week. But let's right now, let's talk about God's love casting out fear. If you let God love you and you let God love others through you, fear has to go. It has to go. 1 John 4, 16 through 18. We have come to know and that believe the love which God has for us. God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God. And God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with this so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because as he is love, he's love, as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. Musicians, if you'll come back. Please bow your heads just for a minute with me. Take time, if you would, before we, we close in our last song. Take time, if you would, just to talk to God and ask him to help you understand completely in your life how to let him love you more and love others through you more. How you can let go. Is there, anything, is there anything in your life that you need to let go so that God can love you more and love others through you more? Because those are the two things that Jesus said will fulfill all the commandments.
Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love others as much as you love yourself. And those are the two things we all need to be aware of. Ask God to work on you in those two areas in your life. Talk to him just for a few minutes before we close in this final song.